for being here. I am so excited to talk about money with you. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brie Castellini. I am Seed and Sparks Film Community Manager, and I am also one half of the filmmaking podcast, Breaking Out of Breaking In, alongside my good friend, Christina Rea. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am joining you all from Burbank, California, uh, otherwise known as the, the occupied and unceded homeland of the Tongva people. For my physical description, I am a white woman with glasses, curly brown hair with a bright red streak on the left side and behind me is my work desk with notable features being a film slate, a painting of a ghost, some festive tiny pumpkins, and a puppet of myself. Um, but enough about me and my puppet, although I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's get to talking about money. So if I could get all of my panelists on screen, Cole, Renee, Colin, and Lucas, uh, I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves. So uh, starting with Cole, whose name just happens to be the first on my list when I was copying and pasting. Cole, can you introduce yourself um, by you know name, most recent project, and the job title you give when people ask you what you do for a living? Sure, thanks so much for the intro. Um, I'm Cole Bacani, I'm a writer and director. Um, one of my most recent projects that's making the festival run right now is called Everything Stays, which is a really personal story about being the first one in a giant Filipino American family to leave home. And um, like I already said, this, I'm a writer, director, and I also do a ton of digital series at Jubilee Media. Very cool. Uh, Renee, how about you next? Yes, hello, um, my name is Renee Mao. Uh, I am a currently based in Australia, but I uh, went to NYU and was living in New York for 10 years up until last year when I came home. I'm working on some projects here. I am a commercial film and TV director is what I um, say, or, you know, I pick one of those depending on how I'm feeling <laughs> at, the, uh, at the moment, because just saying a director, I feel like um, doesn't give a lot of, you know, it is open to interpretation and can be a bit confusing out of context. So I usually put commercial or film or TV in front of that. Uh, and I uh, am currently working on a mini series. It's six 10 minute episodes. Um, it's supported by SBS and Screen Australia here in Australia. Um, so that's uh, my current project that's uh, going into production next month. Yeah. Awesome, thanks so much, uh, Colin. Hi everyone, um, my name is Colin Levy and uh, based in Nevada now. Um, I, uh, I guess my most recent project was uh, uh, this uh, 12 minute YouTube short that I did in collaboration with Zach King, the, uh, the YouTuber illusionist uh, social media guy, uh, which is a super fun um, project I've been working on most of the year. It was released last week on YouTube, so you can go check it out if you want. It's called The Time Traveling Sheriff. Um, and when people uh, ask me what I do, uh, I usually struggle a little bit. It kind of changes depending on who's asking and what mood I'm in. Filmmaker is probably the best catch-all, you know, um, but most recently I've been writing more than anything else and writing in television. So sometimes I say television writer, sometimes I say visual effects artist, you know, um, but writer director, that's really what I want my focus to be. So probably that's my, my most common answer. Use the job title you want to have in the world, something, yep. something. Uh, <laughs> Lucas, please. Hi guys, um, my name is Lucas, um, I live in LA. My most recent project uh, was a four part doc series for a branded doc series for electric car company called Canoe, um, which is a lot of fun. and. My current project, I can't, I can't say the specific details, but it's a, it's a really exciting car commercial and um, short film that's uh, revealing a new car. I'm actually on set for that right now. So it's, oh. it's been a blast and really excited for that to, to come out. Well, thanks so um, much for joining us on location. <laughs> of course. And uh, I just usually call myself a director. Cool. Well, that's that's all great. I, I love the diversity of like super short and super long because I think that's sort of a, a relevant conversation that film and media people have, which is like it's hard to define always sometimes what exactly we do uh, to also encompass all that we do and want to do. Um, so I was I'm always very curious to hear people's answers to that one. Um, so for the audience at home. 
please know that I am prepared to ask as many questions as you will allow me to. However, if any of you have questions for our individual panelists, for our panelists as a whole, please feel free to chime in in the chat or um, by using the Q&A function at the bottom. I'm happy to incorporate your questions throughout. So as they come up for you, please feel free to ask them. Um, but next question for everybody is obviously we're here with Nifty who are a wonderful group of people. And I'm curious how all of you first came into contact with Nifty um, and uh, what you might say about that experience. So let's just go in the same order, um, Cole. Um, I was an official selection way back before I even started college um, in 2016. I think I was 18 years old. And like after one day at Nifty, I started telling everybody, oh yeah, Nifty is probably my favorite film festival. Um, and What made it I your also, favorite film festival? Um, just how everyone was kind of my age or like, you know, similar on experience level. And then also I just really enjoyed Seattle. It was my first time. And I tell everyone now that my favorite city, Seattle, based off of, based off of that one week I spent in Seattle for Nifty when it was sunny. And everyone says, oh, cool. If you spend like a a month there you'll hate it so <laughs> right now it's still my favorite great cool Renee um I unfortunately was never able to go in person to the festival but I've always loved the festival and they've always been so supportive of me the first time I was a part of it was with my uh, thesis film my NYU thesis film which was about a um soldier post world war ii it was a little like 14 minute world war ii film um and that one played there back uh i don't know when that would have been probably 2014 uh and then my other short film that i made about two or three years ago also played at nifty as well so yeah cool colin uh i really wish i had found out about nifty like earlier i was already almost aged out I'm forget what that cutoff was, but I feel like I was a senior in college uh, and um, I submitted two films which got in the first year. And then there was a the following year, I, I, I got three films total in the festival and visited both times. Um, and absolutely, without, without a doubt, it's, that's what I have shared as my, my favorite festival experience. Not that I've had that many, but it's so unique. Um, just the energy, it feels like everyone is there because they're passionate, because they're really, they've discovered something and it's, everyone has this common interest. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the other festivals seem like kind of schmoozy and it's all about, you know, there's like stars walking around and it's, there's a hierarchy and it feels, you know, very intimidating as opposed to the welcoming vibe I got from, from Nifty. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I wish I, I found out closer to like when I started making movies like around 15 or 16, that would have been awesome. I would have been there every year. <laughs> well, hey, tell the teenagers in your life, everybody. Uh, Lucas, how did you get involved with Nifty? Uh, yeah, I had a film at Nifty, I think, I think it was in 2014. And I think the coolest thing has just been like seeing how tight that community is and, and kind of how tight it's stayed since 2014, which is like so many years ago now. Um, and it's just so cool to like see the people that I met that first year that I'm still in touch with and like what they're doing now. And um, I've been back a couple times since and it's, it's just like not changed in a good way. Um, and I think that's really cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing everybody. So let's start talking about the subject that brought us all together today, money. So uh, let's actually take you all back to those first projects, perhaps even the projects that got you into Nifty, if that makes more sense for you. Do you remember what your budget was for that first project, even if it's zero, and what you spent the most money on when you were first starting out? And anybody can take that one first. Well, I made a, a high school short that was really, uh, took, uh, really ambitious, you know, it took over, like almost a year to put together and my wow. budget for that, because my dad was my lead and I shot it in my backyard and I used uh, open source software. So it was really about his wardrobe that had to be very specific. So I bought a, uh, a t-shirt that I remember like, man, this is 35 bucks. Like it's a big investment, you know, I feel like I probably spent maybe a hundred dollars with tapes and everything back in the digital eight days. <laughs> what was so special about the t-shirt? Well, he was a, a character who was obsessed with uh, keeping his lawn pristine and he was very particular. And uh, the, the shirt was a life is good shirt with a man 
with a guy mowing his lawn. So it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was very character forward. Yes, that's course. right. <laughs> Got it. Uh, anyone else remember your first budgets and what, what your biggest spend was? Uh, yeah, I think the film, the, the first film I had at Nifty is a great example. Um, there was no budget and it was like, that's also the reason it happened just because I had so many grand ideas and for years I would just never make anything. Um, money being part of that but also just like I was too ambitious and so this one day I just I was like all right I, I got to do something so I just kind of followed my uncle around for a bit and, and filmed a day in his life and it's yeah I was just like forcing myself to do something was so much more valuable than um, you know waiting for the perfect project and trying to build something massive and I kind of always find that in my life I kind of go in through these cycles of like having to reset and sometimes just start making projects and stop trying to try to plan for the biggest stuff. Um, but that was, yeah, that was no money. And in a cool way that that one project led to like a ton of cool opportunities um, sort of letting me explore that same style, but in a like branded area. When, uh, so biggest, when you say that it, it allowed you that that opportunity, what what does that mean specifically? Like people saw you playing at festivals and offered you work. Yeah. You, okay. Yeah, people saw it. Um, kind of liked the style of it, and um, I think that also got me really excited. Just like I, I also enjoyed the style, and I did so many projects kind of like that, um, following different people around and, and trying to like find stories with with strangers and like I would just go up to strangers sometimes and ask them if I could make a film about them and that was like the second that was the second film I had on Nifty was, was like that but um yeah it just kind of forced me to sort of figure out ways to craft stories when when there's not a full plan cool Renee, um, well, I, yeah I um after probably getting out of um, film school, like, you know, because you have so much access to support and equipment and resources and that can help you with the various different school related projects. Once I got out of um, film school for those first couple of years, I made like various different passion projects, like, you know, stuff that I'd meet an artist or um, a musician or a friend and we just, you know, try and make something together. And I, I always kind of there was no money. It was always self-funded to whatever, you know, or like, you know, and it's always just favors. It's like friends helping you out. Like, you know, you can't, you can't afford to pay crew. And if you uh, have to, if you've got like a big enough crew that you do have to pay crew because you can't find people to do it for free, then that's where your money goes and you pay that out of, out of pocket. Um, and so I did a couple of projects like that. And I think I spent most of my money on getting the equipment that I wanted, like the camera that I wanted, the lenses that I wanted. I think that's one thing I struggled with the most kind of like Lucas was saying I had a film, a passion project that I did that like I had a really specific vision for and I really wanted to look a certain way and like you have like, you know, locations in mind and production design and the way that you want to shoot it, like you want to just, you know, the whole nine yards and like the frustrating thing at that point in my career was like, you know, I can't afford to, to execute the vision. So you sort of do what you can do. And then it's just that sort of struggle with, like I just was never happy with the product because I didn't feel like I, I was able to do it exactly how I wanted to. Um, so yeah, that was all, all part of the journey. But I think in those, for those initial um, passion projects, like I'd always sort of all the money went towards just getting getting equipment and and paying a uh, crew like you know even just getting like a first AC you know it's really hard to ask people to come I think that's the biggest thing um, for me is like to ask people to work for free and to ask people to support you when you're just starting out and you want to make something but you don't have any money um, so for that like I'm so grateful for my friends and my um, you know the network that I had of people that actually supported and it really is like such a community like I help my friends make stuff they help me like it's that that is something that um, was really crucial for those initial projects. Cool. Um, and then I'll keep my answer short and sweet but yeah the first film that I made that got to Nifty I think six years ago was also no budget. Um, I made it in high school, and I think the only thing I spent money on was food for this eight-year-old actress I was working with because she would not act more unless I got her Mexican food. So, 
<laughs> so it was almost a bribe and, and less of a concerted effort to pay her in food. Very cool. You know what? Hey, you got to respect the hustle of actors, even at eight years old. Um, I love that. So with that, obviously, you know, I think all of us probably have a lot of experience with like no budget projects, but I think realistically, we can all also acknowledge that like no project is no budget. You're just getting things for free, whether it's, you know, labor from your friends, equipment from your school, uh, an eight-year-old pre-bribing you for food. <laughs> so like, there's a lot of things that no budget technically has a budget for you just happen to be getting it sort of in kind so i'm curious uh on those projects or beyond um can you all talk about the most expensive thing you've ever gotten for free uh, and let's put aside labor because obviously calling in favors with friends is probably the most expensive thing most of us have gotten for free so aside from people and skill sets is there like a location a prop a piece of equipment something that you got for free that was particularly expensive and can you share how you came to be in uh, in ownership pre briefly for that thing? Um, one of my uh, earlier projects, actually one of the Nifty films um, was about uh, a pilot and it kind of chronicled his life in reverse order um, from you know the moment of his death in a fiery crash um, all the way to the moment of inspiration as a child where he decided he wanted to do this for a living. And because there was so many scenes and sequences, there was, there was so many things I could not believe we ended up getting for free. We got into a, a, a flight simulator cockpit kind of thing for free. Um, a, a, we got a Cessna, you know, to show up at an airfield for free for, for some shots. Um, we, we also had, for the fiery crash scene, an entire fire department came out uh it was it was two big fire trucks and an ambulance and um technically totally for free we we got them pizza but that was it and i think uh, uh I, I pretty much couldn't believe that but it was um possible just because of i don't know uh, our pitch for the project uh they were into it you know they hadn't been in movies before and were interested it was in the middle of nowhere in georgia so it was kind of an exciting thing for them yeah, I mean, that's a good call out is that like, obviously, you know, a lot of advice for filmmaking is to like move to LA, move to New York, uh, or the, you know, respective filmmaking hub in your country of, of choice. But I do think that people don't realize what a huge benefit not being in a film center can be, especially on budget. I shot, uh, I directed a web series in Utah a couple of years ago, and we got like, over $1,500 worth of gear completely for free because no one was making independent projects in the area. And they were just so excited to support, you know, indie filmmakers in the, in the local area that they were like, yeah, sure. Have a, you know, dolly, have all of this random equipment and tracks, just, you know, why not? Just call us out in your credits. Um, and you would not get that usually in LA or New York. So, hey, if you're somewhere off the coast, maybe stay there for a little while. Um, but yeah, other people, what is the most expensive thing that you've gotten for free and how did you get it? Off the top of my head, I can't think of the exact most expensive thing that I've gotten for free, but I feel like, you know, with even with budgets where we have thousands to spend, we always budget like thousands for locations and camera gear, but you just never know like who's going to lend stuff to you. Like a ton of my friends this year, we've been making films in their hometowns. So like small town in Oregon, small town in Idaho. And like for both of those films, we were able to get gear for free similar to what you said, because they're just really excited to see local filmmakers coming back to their small town to like put it on camera and did you just like get in contact with the rental places and say hey we're going to be in town can we have a camera please yeah, yeah yeah i think like even though we budget thousands for everything like it never hurts to ask for these things because yeah. a, a lot of them are just going to help young filmmakers out and it's always a huge surprise totally lucas renee yeah. I, I don't, I've never really gotten anything completely for free. Um, I've, I've been, you know, I've got gear for discounted prices and stuff like that. But um, I think most of the stuff that I made early on that I was self-funding basically was, I was in New York for most of it sure. and it's very hard to get. Yeah, I mean, locations-wise, like sometimes, like depending on who you're working with, um, 
like uh, that you can get locations for free or if someone's involved in the project um they can donate their space like that's happened even on like a branded thing that i did um for make a wish foundation like you know of course it's a non-profit organization like people like the disney ranch would donate like a location so like that's happened but it's not um i feel like i've always had to sort of pay for most things you know i'm not really ever been handed anything for free especially in terms of like gear or and stuff like that yeah sure yeah yeah i i, I also don't have a, a great one for that um that's fair yeah i'm sorry about that no, it's fine. I mean, that's also relevant to know that, hey, some people get stuff for free, some people don't. But I agree with Cole. The worst you can do is get a no or a complete ignoring of your email. The best thing that can happen is you get stuff for free. You never know. Um, so let's talk about other kinds of money and budget building. So I'm curious for all of you, uh, specifically for independent projects, like what have been your primary sort of fundraising methods? Is it self-funding and just sort of saving up during your day job times? Is it finding brands and partnerships? Is it crowdfunding investors? Yeah. What, what has been your methodology for building a budget? Um, and what are things that you've learned about those fundraising methods that you didn't know before? Little secrets you can give us from that, from that experience. I think this is probably, uh, I, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't fundraised that much at all. Um, 99% of my projects are branded and commercial. So that's kind of where the money comes from. But uh, I do have one project in mind that I could kind of speak to, which is, and, and I think some good advice there is like finding other creatives that you really like working with. And so for instance, um, when I am self-funding a project, like I would kind of go to a DP that I really like working with and kind of ask if they would be interested in, in working on it too. And, and so I've done things in the past where we split things like that. And I think that's kind of a nice way to go. It also, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure on yourself if you're sort of trying to put all the money in it and convince people that it's, it's, it's worth, worth of, um, them working on. So I think kind of a non-traditional device there is like find people to team up with and, and do that. And it's, yeah, I think there's tons of DPs who would be psyched to do something like that if the story's right and the collaboration's right and probably tons of other roles as well. Yeah, sharing the burden, but also sharing ownership and excitement about something can be huge. Anyone else? Investing experience, project so, experience? Yeah, I've had a, a variety of, of experiences on probably, you know, six or seven different sort of independent shorts um, two of them were crowdfunded with Kickstarter. So my senior film, one of the ones that uh, uh, screened at Nifty was, we raised $10,000 via Kickstarter. And that was my first crowdfunding experience. And it was, um, you know, it really was uh, uh, a big project, just the crowdfunding part. Um, but we put together a video, you know, I kind of pitched the project and I had a team together already. I had a lot of resources from school. I had some concept art to show and I had some previous work to kind of point to also. Um, so uh, I was pretty fortunate that we were able to meet that goal. And sort of because of that project, uh, several years later, when I was crowdfunding again, I, I had a, you know, more confidence that, that we could raise at least that. And the goal for that one was 35K and we ended up raising over $50,000 uh, wow. for it. And it was a very ambitious independent short. Um, but the strategy for that one was that I, I really wanted to show something really sizzly, you know, and, and so we actually financed uh, production uh, separately, which I can speak to. That was my first uh, independent financier showed up out of the blue to help help actually um, shoot the thing. And then we raised money specifically for post, it was a very visual effects heavy project. Um, but we could put together a really kick-ass trailer um, as a part of the Kickstarter and show some behind the scenes from from the set and that kind of thing. Uh, make it very clear that this is this this is happening and we're going to mm -hmm. get to the finish line and it's going to be worth it in the end. Um, and both of those were really positive experiences. Uh, the one thing I'll say is, <laughs> I uh, the 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 second Kickstarter that was in 2017 and I'm still working on getting the rewards out 
to people. And, Are they a lot of like physical rewards? Like yeah, shirts and yeah, and, yeah. And, you, and it you weighs on me that. every day. <laughs> 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 Got to be careful with that. Yeah, fair enough. So really quickly though, I'm going to push you on uh, a financier that came uh, to you out of the blue. What what does that mean? How can yeah. we also pluck a financier from the clouds? Amazing thing that I get the sense never happens. But um, sure. I uh, uh, got an email, a random email from from a guy who uh, uh, had seen some of my previous work, had been writing a feature film, uh, and was interested in having me take a look at it and consider directing the the his project. And um, he hadn't he hadn't been in you know in, in the film world at all, but it's been kind of a lifelong dream of his. He owns a, a fa family owned kind of grocery type thing in New York. And um, for some reason or another, he kind of came across my work and it spoke to him. So uh, this email, you know, it became clear in early conversations that like he does not have, you can't make a feature for, you know, for tens of thousands of dollars. You really need a lot more than that. Um, but I was like, I am, I'm making a, I'm making a short. <laughs> if you want to come on board for that, because he was, he was planning on financing, self-financing that feature. And it was a relationship I developed over the course of, you know, maybe a couple of years just by email, passing emails back and forth. And um, for a time, he seemed interested in this short. Um, I sent him some early drafts, kept on working on it. I ended up sending him a later draft that he wasn't a fan of, and he had some notes. And I was actually like, I, I really think this is the right direction. So we kind of parted ways. And, um, and then it was literally like the week before we were, I mean, we, we were all set to shoot and I didn't really know how we were going to do it. <laughs> and I kind of came to him begging, you know, in a way, like, I know that we've been talking about this for, you know, on and off, but uh, it would be amazing if you could be a part of this journey. And, and he, he came on board and it, it really made a huge, huge difference. Wow, that's amazing. So had he seen your work at like film festivals or did he I think just mostly like online filmmakers? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I'm so curious. Okay. I mean, I think it was probably on YouTube, but maybe Vimeo. <laughs> I have no idea. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, and uh, before I get to the next folks answering this question, just remember, if you are in the audience and have questions, please ask questions. We are happy to answer them. And if you have crowdfunding specific questions, sounds like Colin definitely can weigh in. But uh, on behalf of Seed and Spark, I'm also happy to weigh in. So ask us your questions. We, we want to hear from you. Um, but yeah. What what other um, primary fundraising methods can y'all talk about? Um, I feel like a lot of my shorts in the past few years have been a combination of crowdfunding and executive producers that I've kind of just met along the way of my filmmaking journey. And then also, you know, a lot of my directing friends also have their own set of executive producers. Like one friend has this guy from a show she's been on. Another friend has like mentors who donate thousands to her films. So kind of what we did after we graduated was start a small production company and like combined all of our work into a reel and kind of like sent that out to all of our executive producers ever. And like this year we've been able to produce like 10 short films kind of on the scale of like 30 to 50 K just by combining all of our executive producers and getting them excited about all of our work as a collective. So we're slowly, you know, getting away from crowdfunding and being able to just rely on good relationships that we've been making over the past four or five years and combining all that together. Sure. Uh, and what, what, when you did crowdfund, what were, what did your budgets tend to be? And uh, what did you take away from those processes? They were anywhere from like 10 to uh, just in our collective, so far, like 10 to like 45,000 that we've tried to raise this year. And each one has made over hundred percent so far. And the one thing I Congrats. would take from it is that it is definitely a full-time job for like a month. Um, yep. Yeah. It's a full-time job and everyone, everyone who's, crowdfunded with us has gone different routes for finding that money like I had one friend who kind of went to his high school in Idaho and asked them like what organizations have donated to the school in the past and like can you give me contact with them another friend who's been on a, a few like network series has asked like her you know showrunners and things like that I don't know how much we can talk about that and then like for me personally I've been working at these smaller production companies like Jubilee and Wong Fu have been super helpful too and then on top of that we just have our pool of EPs that you know from the get-go we kind of get excited about all of our work as a collective rather than just like one person's. 
Paul, is, are those shorts that um, you're approaching these EPs for? Mm -hmm. yeah. how, do you, how do you find that you kind of get, I feel like getting investors for short films is so tough. Cause yes. it's, I, I mean, there, there's like no return and <laughs> it's, yeah. I'm curious, like how you get people excited about that. Yeah, I think it's just, it's honestly about, God, I've been asked that before and I, I always want to say it's kind of luck, but I mean, like, it's also just like, you know, we also kind of pitch all of our shorts as like proof of concepts for long form and kind of, uh, you know, pitch them as long form proof of concepts before we even like say that they're short films. So every, Lucas, I know like um, you've, you've probably seen a ton of the shorts that we've been making all over Instagram and stuff. Um, all of those we've pitched as proof of concepts for something long form and then kind of the goal to just be making long form next year. And like this year is to get like these 10 shorts out. Um, oh, cool. So do, you, do those same like investors or EPs kind of come on with the idea that it might turn into something more feature -like? Yeah, and they're investing into the larger thing. Like um, I'm sure I could talk about this because like they're just good friends at this point, but Jubilee is like really they're a digital media company they have a bunch of unscripted shows on youtube right now but they're really interested in branching up to long form and it was kind of you know when i say luck it was kind of like you know i found them at the right time because they're just now starting to like branch out to long form so they want some like you know things that can be long form and then um you know executive producers too that we've had are also interested in long form and have been like helping us with shorts before and i don't know just to awesome. chime yeah, yeah. in on the same topic, that was that was also my pitch to the to the financier that I was just talking about. Uh, that particular short was very much designed as a proof of concept for a feature that I uh, was beginning to write around the same time, and and we sold it. You know, we did sell the short um, and sell the feature, and it's now set up and it's in development as a as a TV show. So. In his case, um, because the option fee is so small, we're still, he still hasn't broken even, but I think he's got a pretty decent chance of seeing a return, which is also <laughs> doesn't happen often. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad that you're all talking about this because I was going to ask, since all of you have done short form, some of you more than others, and I was curious about that landscape. But before we, we move on to that and then some great audience questions that just came in, I think, Renee, have you talked about primary fundraising methods yet and what you learned from them? Yeah, um, I, it's it's the hardest part, and I feel like it's a hard one to give advice on because there's no, no sure. direct way to do it. I only um, crowdfunded with my... Uh, the, like my NYU film um, and I never did it again I found it really stressful and I found that most of the people that were coming and giving me money were friends and family and friends of family and um, that pressure was quite um, yeah I didn't enjoy it um, and so I, I didn't I didn't do it again everything from there was just through like it was self-funded basically and um, I think another thing also just observing friends of mine and what they've done another thing is like there's there's grants out there that exist even if they're very small amounts of money and there's also a lot of different programs especially if you're living in a place like LA Seattle um, New York like there's there is access to those sorts of things and and doing research into programs like that um, for example like the Jacob Burns Film Center um, north of New York City I think they're up in Westchester or north up up there somewhere, um, they have a program where you can apply and they basically support you for a semester. You do workshops with them every week to make a short film and they help with that. They donate, you know, equipment, they give you some money. Like, so th those things out there I've found um, in the past have been like really, I think the way that I would go to try and get something made as opposed to like asking, um, you know, crowdsourcing or, or just, you know, asking for money in, in other places. Uh, and the other thing is, is just like, there's no, there's no one way to do it. You just have to get, you just have to make stuff. Like you, you, one project you make leads to the next project and leads to meeting people that want to support you for your next project. And um, like, I, I made a short film a few years ago that was very small budget. I think it was probably a couple of grand and I, that money went towards paying for the location. And um and probably the camera as well. Um, and it was like, you know, friends of mine who were acting in it. It was friends of mine who were helping me make it. Um, but that film, like at the time, and, and I did everything, that's the other thing. Like I wrote it, I directed it, I edited it. I just did everything that I could 
um, on it. And I wasn't completely satisfied with it. I felt, you know, frustrated with the lack of resources and wasn't totally happy, but that film like opened up all these different doors for me. And like, it's just like the act of making it in itself was uh was the thing that led to the next opportunity and i just can't emphasize that enough like when people ask me that question it's just like even if you um aren't happy with it even if you don't have the resources that you want even if you don't have the money that you want just just make something like still just try and make something um because that's yeah that's what's gonna get you places yeah i, I like that a lot that's also why i like try not to save ideas because i found that when I do them, I'll just learn so much from it and be like, and that will take me to the next thing. And I'll be like, so glad that I got that out of my system and I'm able to like move on to the next project. So like, personally, that's just a way it's, that kind of gets me to, to make more stuff is like, you know, knowing that if I make the idea, I'm going to find a better idea after that. And I like that. Yeah. And, and also just thinking back to the first film I made in film school, like, back then our mindsets were so like we just want to have the best equipment and the best this and the best that like and you know the, the f5 sony f5 that the school gave us like wasn't good enough like thinking back to that sort of thinking just blows my mind because now it's sort of like i just don't the only thing that matters is, is the story the film like your your project it's all that the whistles and bells just don't matter at the end of the day and so at that early stage of you're making something like you don't need all the fancy equipment you don't need the stuff you think you need like you just need a good story you need a good script and and from there like you know some people to help you make it and and uh yeah so so true yeah. <laughs> yes no exactly I, it's funny like the first thing I ever made was in graduate school I made a 10 episode web series that was found footage and shot on a 2011 camcorder in 2015 to just tell you what our equipment situation was like and that web series has gotten me every job I've had since then my job at Seed and Spark my job at Sterable before this my job at MTV before that and a dozen you know paid freelancing gigs so it, there, you know, nothing is stopping you except for you in many, many ways. And I also just want to call out the fact that uh, something that all of you have echoed at this point is that one of the biggest sort of like budget helped, but also just biggest like things that have helped you all in your career is networking laterally, which I think is something that gets missed in a lot of these conversations when we do panels about like, you know, how to get funding, how to get better work. I think there's an assumption that in order to get great work and to make great work, you have to be networking with like the people above you, you know, in the food chain. But I think that more often than not, opportunities are more plentiful and probably better if you're networking with people at your own level, finding DPs who are passionate about the work that you're passionate about, finding people who have similar types of work that you can, you know, collaborate with and make a production company with to pool your mentoring resources, friends willing to donate their time and labor in order to make something that everyone is excited about. Um, so don't discount the people who are right next to you in service of finding someone ahead of you. Oftentimes lateral networking is probably far more useful. So um, I wanted to talk about short form content, but we might not have time for that because there are some really great questions uh, in the in the Q&A. So question from Sid, this is less about money, but how do you keep moving forward on films even when you feel like no one is listening to you or you're doing it on your own how do you keep moving on projects anyone sorry Bri, do you mind repeating that question one more time of course yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh oh it went away um basically how do you keep me moving forwards on films when you feel like no one is listening to you or you're doing it on your own basically how do you keep moving on projects where there feels like there's not a, a lot of uh, other support yet i i uh i guess i'll just jump in here to talk a little bit about my film skywatch because i worked on it for seven years it's 10 minutes long so you know if you do the math it was uh it's a lot of time to work on one thing and i was pretty like i was consistently working on it the whole time um and it gets to be a slog and it gets to you know it, it, it is so challenging you know like psychologically to be a filmmaker working with very meager resources and to be the one pushing forward you know kind of responsible you've got to sort of be the one you know, leading the charge on a project. Um, for me, it was the fact that I still, you know, just 
felt connected to the material and felt excited about what it was that I was was doing. Um, you know, I, over time, I feel like I've gone from being sort of ext externally motivated to intrinsically motivated. So if you think less about, oh, the world's going to love this or, oh, you know, what, what it's going to do for my career or, you know, see the dollar signs or, you know, in, in some far flung future, if it's just like I'm enjoying the process and this fulfills me, you know, and I'm learning, I can feel myself growing and stretching. I feel like that uh, for me has been where the joy of filmmaking is now, you know, um, and that kind of gets you through it, the multiple projects too. It's like, it does it almost doesn't matter if you're at the beginning of the process or you've just premiered something, you're just filmmaking and you're just an artist and, you know, and you're growing and, and, um, and for me, it's, it's just, it's turned into a lifestyle <laughs> almost, or it's just, I get up and I kind of push forward. Um, and there's, t there's lots of doubt that creeps in. It's really hard to keep at bay. I think, you know, surrounding yourself with people who are um, supporters of what you're doing, cheerleaders, uh, um, you know, people who believe in you uh, and who are on also honest with you and, and will look at the work and help you make it better. I think all, all that, you know, certainly helps me. Great. Anyone else want to talk about continuing on when it, things feel maybe a little hopeless? Yeah, I'll just quickly add too that like you're going to learn so much more if you actually finish the film. There have been so many films that I personally didn't even really like and like didn't want to finish. One being like my USC senior thesis film. And um, I, I finished it though and I didn't love the final product. But so many of the things I learned from that, I was able to carry on into my next film, which I talked about at the beginning, which is Everything Stays, which is doing opening so many doors I never thought could all because of the things I learned just by like finishing strong with that that film that I didn't really have that much hope for. Sometimes it's about what you learn along the way rather than the end destination. That's extremely true. I have the same experience on my thesis film. I lost all the sound for it and it's been, it took me like two years to finish. I had to edit it with no sound and then ADR. It was terrible, like, but it was oh, such no. a good experience. Um, but I think uh, in terms of motivation, um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. I think that every single person in this industry is battling um, balancing external validation with self, like, you know, that inner motivation. And I think that the biggest thing that I keep reminding myself and that I think we all have to keep reminding ourselves is that it's not about, it's not about what festival it gets into or you know, all that external stuff. It's not about the Vimeo stuff pick or whatever it is that you're after. Um, if you if you let yourself be motivated by those things, then I don't think that's sustainable. Um, and I think it's a, something that I don't think any of us quite, you know, it's just part of the industry. It's a really hard thing to battle. So for me, it's just, it's in it. Like you just have, to, like, if you don't, you need to have the drive on your own for whatever reason um, you are doing this and for, for whatever reason you want to make films. And be in this industry and um, that however, however you find that that's crucial I think um, because the the other way of, of making stuff just to get get the validation it's just not yeah it's not going to last so you can't and control that exactly it's uh you'll have ups and downs ups and downs ups and downs and um, you know I've friends who have had the most successful films have gone to you know everyone's you look at at their success on social media or whatever it may be and be like that's what I want and then you actually meet that person and they're really just unsatisfied and and all and tackling self-doubt and they don't you know it, everyone's going through it no matter what um who's validating your work and and where it's gone and um that's yeah it's, it's there's no real answer I don't I think there's an answer to that question other than just like you have to find a way to like you know keep moving forward and believe in yourself yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair that probably everyone has a very different answer to that question. I experienced that a lot with, especially with editing, um, because it's such a grueling process sometimes. And a lot of like my style of editing is kind of like, I usually don't edit off of a script. It's sort of like piecing it together. And um, I don't know, I, like I started to realize I started to, I feel kind of like that on every project. And so I sort of just like twisted it in my head and. So I, I kind of look at it as just a part of the creative process and um, it sucks, but 
like that's just how you make creative stuff it's like you have to sift like I have a big piece of paper but my computer says sift because like when I'm working I'm just like getting rid of the bad stuff um literally and metaphorically but it's it's not easier but I, I I kind of look at it less as like something is wrong with me or or what I'm doing and more like it's just a hard process and um there's like it's by by continuing you're already setting yourself apart from you know a lot of other people totally it's almost like you have to go through all of the stages of grief before you can move on to the next one it's like you can't skip from you know bargaining to acceptance sometimes you got to just go with the whole process and just let it wash over you until you move through it yeah um okay cool so we have a anonymous attendee who has a question about branded content since obviously a lot of you work with that uh you might not actually have an answer to this question because i imagine many of you work like for the brands but do any of you have an experience ha have any experience with uh getting brands to put the bill for short form content be it web series or short films have you ever you know worked at a, a deal where they kind of but the bill, maybe through including their product or service in the web series, including them as like a presented by, anyone have experience on that end? It's fine if not. Pretty cool <laughs> um, opportunity last year um, where um, I was able to do a short film kind of in a partnership with a brand. And it was, yeah, it was really cool. Kind of like the best of both worlds, like the ability to tell something narrative and you know have have the support and resources to do that um it was a it was a ballet company and since covid hit you know they couldn't do their nutcracker performance and so they were kind of exploring different different methods and i think at some point a live stream was on the table and they were also considering something a little more narrative and i like definitely pushed them towards the narrative side and because i thought that would be so cool and i still think it's so cool um, so we, we kind of like took their production and, and made it into a short film, sort of like a fictionalized version that kind of touches on some Nutcracker themes, but um, in very, very much is, is its own film. Um, so that was, that How was did you get really connected cool with them? Um, I had done a short doc for them two years prior. So, and and that was from them seeing some other work I did and it was, it all kind of comes back to that first Nifty film. Um, you know, yeah. That one led to that the next thing and so on. A lot of word of mouth, yeah. Yeah, remember networking guys, laterally everywhere. Network with other filmmakers, make films so you can network with other filmmakers. Anyone else have experience with uh, branded content um, specifically for like narrative content? I. I don't have anything, um, you know, specifically to that question, which is like if you how how to like partner with, or how to reach out to a brand that you have in mind to partner with you. Um, but I would just say, like, just encourage people to that cold emails work. Um, a lot of the time they don't work, but um, it is definitely worth uh, reaching out to people, even if you don't have a point of connection, whether it's through LinkedIn or whether wh however you find them. Um, I would just say, like, make sure that if you're, if you're reaching out with a cold email that you are presenting something that's organized and thorough and like, you know, it's really helpful to attach like a pitch deck or a treatment um, that's, you know, really well thought out because people will respond if, if they feel like you are in control. Like if you have a good plan and vision and, um, you know, whatever other support you can sort of in, like attach to that project when you're reaching out, whether it's like, you know, a, an executive producer or someone that you can put on there that, again like you know if someone receives a cold email they just want to go oh okay this looks this looks exciting or this is something i want to be involved in and um, i think having a pitch deck or something like that is really important cool awesome um so these other two questions we kind of a little bit covered but just just to to wrap up the the session uh stadskin asks how would you recommend an emerging screenwriter approaches directors and producers with their projects and i will just say network laterally go to film festivals and talk to people but do do any of you have uh, advice since many of you are directors and producers yourselves on how theoretically a, a new screenwriter could approach you in a more favorable way I think maybe like 
putting like trying to build those connections and relationships just in general and I think I, I feel like it's, it is kind of tough to just like say hi here's my script like I personally I just don't know if that's like a great a great way to meet someone um, so I feel like of course it's, it's happened and it will but um, I feel like maybe a good way to approach it is just always be on the lookout for cool people to meet and you know at some point you're gonna have the right script for the right person um, that's my take on it yeah, it's almost like from Colin's experience, either have money <laughs> to to go along with your your screen earning pitch or network organically, <laughs> like Lucas is sort of mentioning, and maybe eventually it will become appropriate for you to be like, by the way, I have a script, no money, but we're friends now, so that shouldn't matter. That, that one's a tough one. Uh, I think one other sort of sneaky method um, might be about collaborating on something that the director is bringing to the table. Um, I'm working currently with two screenwriters on two projects at co-writing, um, each of whom have their own scripts also. And I, I, uh, it was, it was, I, I was interested to, you know, to, to start off those collaborations. Uh, I was interested to read their work as a judge of like, was, is this going to be a good creative fit? for us to collaborate on something else, you know, but those are bearing fruit, those relationships, um, perhaps not in, in the way that you were, the question asker is, is envisioning, but that, that can be interesting, especially if you're, if you're open to the idea of co-writing. Um, the other thing I'll say is, is, uh, log lines, one pagers, um, pitch decks are all a lot easier to crack open and read and get a, you know, vibe off of, uh, compared to a, to a full script, you know? So, so a good one, one pager, I think I'm, I'm always kind of curious to, to, to read, you know, something short. <laughs> yeah. That's a good call is like, even with cold emails, you want to be thorough, but you want to be concise, give them the high level, most impressive information that both, you know, establishes who you are and, and why you should be paid attention to, but also establishes what sets this story apart, hopefully in a way that appeals specifically to who you're reaching out to. Don't just send a producer who exclusively makes sci-fi content, like your rom-com script. You know what I mean? Like make sure you're reaching out because this is the right person and not just because this is a person whose email address you found or something like that. Context matters. Um, all right. So the, the final question I think we already kind of naturally responded to is just about like ways other than crowdfunding y'all have fundraised. So as it is now 6 p.m., um, tell us how we can support the four of you outside of this panel. Where are we going to hear about you next? Where should we be following along with your careers so that we can stay appraised of them? We'll go in the original order. So Cole, you first. Oh, man. Um... Gosh, uh, my next film is coming out on Amaletto pretty soon. So you can catch it there. It's called Everything Stays. I think it's coming out in like a month. I haven't picked a specific date, but I requested November. And then, um, yeah, I'm always also super down to read scripts. So send them to me. Cool. Uh, where, where? Do you have a website, a social media handle? I, could, I can put an email in, in the chat too. Oh, wow. If you're willing to put an email in the chat, you are a braver man than most. So uh, <laughs> go on, Cole. Uh, next up, Renee. Next project, where can we find you? Um, my next project will be on SBS On Demand here in Australia and on Viceland in the States. So you can watch it there. Um, otherwise, just my website and social media is a good way to keep, um, keep track of me. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Colin. Um, yeah, uh, well, I'm mostly working on Skywatch, basically this, that same short, you know, we're working on it as a, as a TV show. So I'm, we're in early development, but that's what I'm hoping uh, eventually reaches the some sort of screen. Um, it'll take a while. But in the meantime, um, yeah, you could follow uh, my, my, my at is Colin Levy, my full name basically everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube even, I think, is all my name, and ConnellLeavy.com. So, you know, take your pick. <laughs> awesome. And Lucas. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, probably my website is the best spot um, to stay in touch or, or keep up, yeah. 
And what what website is that? Just your name.com? Just my name, yeah. Lucasbond. And you as well, Renee? Just name.com? Renee Mount.com? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And I think Nifty <laughs> has like bios with links and stuff on their, their um, workshops. So thank you so much for all for joining us. Uh, if you are curious about crowdfunding and how to make it slightly less terrible, uh, I will validate. I, I have crowdfunded a lot. A lot of it is terrible, but I promise, and this is not just me, you know, slinging for the corporate masters or whatever, is that Seed Spark actually genuinely does make crowdfunding a lot less terrible. So it is still a full-time job. So if you're curious how we do that, uh, seedandspark.com will give you a bunch of resources. You can also email me at any time crowdfunding at seedandspark.com and ask me all of your questions big and small about crowdfunding and if you need a new indie film podcast to listen to uh, that offers advice on money as well as all of the other big and small things that go into creating work including things as broad as imposter syndrome breaking out of breaking in uh, is potentially that podcast for you find episodes at breakingoutpod.com and thank you so much to nifty for having all of us here tonight uh, and to all of you for for watching Thank you.